All right, continuing on here. Before we're we're about to discuss hair length in the Bible, but before I do, I made a note. I said, Chris, you've got to talk about this, otherwise people don't know about it. Well, we finished. Grant and I had been working the past year on getting out this Age of the Earth, this Creation Seminar Number One. Okay, and we wanted to get that out there so that people had free access to it, and we finally did. And you can go onto the video section at creationliberty.com. You can type in, you just click on video. It's a link on the left hand side there. And you can see it there. Not only can you watch it, stream it for free, you can also download it for free. Okay? So if you just click on the little download button there, you can download it. And like I said, that's all available for free. We don't have any copyrights on this other than a Creative Commons license, which just simply says you can't reproduce it for, for profit. Like we can sell it, and we are, Lorraine and I are, are in the works right now to produce a DVD that we can sell for it. But other than that, Nobody else is allowed to sell it. If you take it and you want to copy it, you can burn it on and pass it out to as many people as you want. There is no limitation on that. We don't have any problem with people doing that. So that's why we made that available for free. Yes, we are going to sell a DVD copy if you want to purchase one in the future, but if you don't or don't have the money for it, just get your DVD and burn your own copy or just download it and put it on your computer. It is available for free. So I want to make make that aware because I'm not very good at at advertising myself. I don't, I'm not very good at promoting and advertising myself, which is why I rely on so many of you guys to help me do that because I'm just not, I never remember to do it. I just want to get to the topic at hand, you know? And so, but if I don't tell people what we have available, then people don't know and then I forget to do it and, and that's what happens all the time. So I have to have other people make sure that they help me do that. So anyway, this issue of hair length in the Bible the problem here, I guess, is there, there's going to be a lot of contention come out of this one. And surprisingly, it's it's one of the most simplistic issues I have ever seen in Scripture. But there's so many people that have a problem with it. And this is what you're going to find out after we get done with this, is that really a number of them, I'm not saying all of them are like that, I said, but a, probably the majority of people I see debating on this issue are the Christian rockers. Amazing, these Christian rock folks out there, the Christian in quotations, that are listening to all their wicked rock music and stuff and trying to justify it, typically fight on this issue as well. And I want people to understand, you are not going to hell because of the length of your hair. Okay, that's a work. That, does, that has nothing to do with your salvation, okay? It's not the determining factor in your salvation, but it is a determining factor of Christ's authority over your earthly life. Okay, it's, it's, this issue is about authority, not about saving grace. So we need to make sure that I put that in distinction, that you guys understand the difference between the two. We're not talking about somebody's salvation here. This is talking about authority. It's an outward physical sign of our submission to the authority over us as Christians. Okay, and if we want to, re if, if you guys, you know, any of you out there feel like you want to rebel against Christ's doctrine, that is your, your business, okay? Uh, and But there's a lot of people that are trying to be contentious over this issue, and I'll show you some reasons why for that later. But the place we need to start to understand this is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to start in verse 1, and I'm going to, basically, we're going to tiptoe through this, and we're going to go through it very slowly, verse by verse, word by word, so you can see exactly what this is saying and get the proper context. Because, folks, I have read website after website, there are unbelievable amounts of false teaching and personal opinions floating around and very, very few people that actually teach directly what this says. So in verse 1, it says, Be ye followers of me. Now this is Paul writing, okay? Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So here, Paul is now telling us, he's getting ready to explain one of the ordinances he gave to the body of Christ in Corinth. Okay? Now he keeps this, now I want you to understand that this, what he's writing here, even though Paul is writing this, this is, Paul wrote it through inspiration of the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are the Lord Jesus Christ's commandments to us. Okay? So I want you to make sure you guys understand whose authority this is being written under. So in verse 3, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. So, the order of authority starts out with God, then it goes to Christ, then it goes to man, then it goes to woman. 
this is the system that God designed, okay? If you don't like that system, then go find some other pagan god to worship. If you want to say, well, I don't think God's like that, then you already serve another god. You serve an idol in your mind that you're calling Jesus Christ, because that's not the Christian God of the Bible, the one you're referring to. The Jesus Christ of the Bible says there is, an, there is four steps in order of authority here, okay? Now, there's women that don't like that. There's some men that don't like that. I don't care what you do and don't like. Your personal feelings are not part of this, okay? My personal feelings are not part of this. What God's word says is where our authority comes from, okay? Now, when it says every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head, I was one of those people for the longest time that thought that he was dishonoring his skull or his brain or the thing that sits on his neck, this piece. Okay, that's not what's dishonoring. When it says dishonoreth his head, he's dishonoring the authority. Head has has multiple meanings, multiple meanings in this context. Okay, head, the word head is used many a number of times in First Corinthians eleven, but it has two different meanings. Head can mean the the physical head, where your skull and everything like that is resting on. Okay, your physical head, and the other head can mean the authority that is over you. So we need to make sure that we understand both of them. And here it says, when having his head covered, that is your physical head, dishonoreth his head, which is the authority over you, okay? So honor means to revere, to treat with deference and submission. In this specific context, that's what that means. So if a man goes to God in prayer or prophesying, and when prophesying is rebuking from the scripture, you know, teaching truth and, and, and being a proper watchman, all that kind of stuff. In the prophesying and prayer, if, a God, if he goes to God and, and does these things, and he has long hair at the same time, he refuses to revere and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we have to understand. He might, I mean, someone who does this might even be saved, but he is rebelling against the authority of Christ. And that's what we need to understand about that verse right there, okay? So now we have a context that, that what he's talking about and having his head covered. And now some people say, well, Chris, it's just talking about a covering. How do you know it's talking about hair? Well, because we're going to find out more specifically that he talks about that. He makes that specific point. I'll show you. But let's continue in verse 5. It says, but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So we have a similar situation for women. If a woman prays or rebukes from the scripture with short hair, then she's dishonoring her head. So the head of her is man, and then what's the head of man? Christ. So in the line of authority, if she, re if she prays or rebukes with short hair, like a man, then she is refusing to revere and submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. So when men with short hair do it, women, women with long hair do it, that is proper according to scripture. Now, at the end of verse 5, he goes to prove a point now here, because he says, that is even all one as if she were shaven. So meaning that if you don't have a proper length on it, it might as well be shaven at that point. And I'll show you what I mean here in, ver in, in uh, verse 6. It's for, it says, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if, she, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. So what he's doing here is not telling you, you need to go shave your head. Okay, if you have short hair, that's not what he's saying here. He's proving a point. Because for any of you women out there, if I were to grab you and turn on a electric razor and start to put it near your head, you are going to get really upset, probably try to hit me and all sorts of stuff, not to shave your head. Why is it that so many women get upset when they're cutting their hair? Or, you know, if they're going to, like, donate... Like, there's women that have donated their hair before to people who want wigs or things like that. They've done that kind of thing before. But when they cut off their hair, they get so nervous about it. Why is this such a big issue for women to go through this kind of thing? Because, for them, it is a shame for them to be shorn or shaven. It's a shame for them to have short hair. And they, they know that, okay? Deep in their hearts, they once they have that hair... It's a glory to her, as we're going to see here, and the scripture's going to say in just a moment. But it says, if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, then let her be covered. So that means if, you're, if it's a shame, if women, are, I mean, he's, he's showing you that in your own hearts, from your own consciences, that you're supposed to have lengthy hair. 
I'm not saying you have to have hair going down to your ankles or some people that do that kind of thing, okay? But that's not, I'm not saying you have to have that. I'm not saying it's wrong to have that. I'm not saying that you have to either, okay? But since it is that, he says, well, then let her be covered. So it continues in verse 7. It says, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of, of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So, God was not created for man. He's, he wasn't created at all. He's eternal. But man was created for God. So, Christ was not created for the church. He's, he's not created at all. He's eternal. But the church was created for Christ. And man did not come from woman initially, but a piece of Adam was taken to create Eve as a helpmeet. Therefore, the woman should be in submission to the man's authority as a head over herself, and by doing so, she's in submission to Christ. So, in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 10, it says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, this verse has been misinterpreted to mean all sorts of things. All right, There's been a lot of wacky doctrines that have been taught from this verse right here, but we need to put this one to rest, okay? The power being referred to here is not power in your hair. Your hair does not have power in itself, okay? But that is referring to the power is the authority she submits unto, which is Christ. Now concerning the angels, if you go to Hebrews chapter 1, and starting in verse 10, it says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, as a vesture that shall fold them up, fold up them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to that to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool? Okay, so he, what he's saying here is that he, he never said to the angels that he's like, I'm going to make thine enemies thy footstool. He said to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Son of God, to his Son, he said, I'm going to make your, thy enemies your footstool. Okay, And then it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be, the, be heirs of salvation? So he's saying here that the angels are not just messengers. They are also ministering spirits. They are sent forth to minister to those who will be the heirs of salvation. Well, who's going to be the heirs of salvation? The born-again Christians. The angels are sent forth to minister unto us if we will seek after the truth and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we will clean out our lives, he will send angels to minister unto us when we need it. Okay. But the angels do not minister to those who reject Christ. See, someone who's going to refuse to submit to the authority of Christ, the angels are not going to minister to those people. So, see, they're going to minister to those born-again women who have submitted to the authority over them, just like they will minister to the men who have submitted to the authority over them. So when a woman submits to the authority of her husband, when he does wrong, she's not held accountable for that because she's sim simply submitting to his head. He is held accountable for what he has done wrong, but she's not held accountable for that. And she is, if she does what is right by God, she is protected by the ministers, ministering angels that are not seen. So what he's doing here is reminding women of their place, and then also turns around and reminds men in their place in the next verse. But the point being here is that what he says is that she has power on her head. That long hair represents the submission to the authority over her as being a helpmeet, okay? And so through that, the Lord Jesus Christ protects her. That it doesn't mean that she's never going to be harmed? No. Because again, we have lots of martyrs in this world, okay? But the blessing of God is over her for that. And so that long hair is a physical outward sign of that. That doesn't mean that if for some reason you had your hair cut off against your will or something like that, or something happened along those lines, that you're not in submission to God, okay? God understands those issues. But if you have a choice in the matter, grow your hair out, okay, as a covering for your head. But then men are reminded of their place as well. In 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 11, it says that nevertheless, 
Neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So this is a point to where in Second Corinthians, in, you know, the next book that he writes to the Corinthians, in Second Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, and prove your own selves. Okay, when it says that, that's something that we need to do. So first of all, women... You need to be reminded that you were created to be a helpmeet to men, okay? Men, you need to be reminded that woman brought you forth in travailing pain. So both positions need to be understood and handled properly. The, in, in the terms of husband and wife, the wife gives reverence to the husband. The husband loves the wife as his own body, okay? That's what we're instructed to do in Scripture. But the most important thing that all of us here need to understand is that in the spirit, there is neither male nor female. And that all things are set this way by God. That's why he says, all th but all things of God. These, this order of authority is not going to apply the same way in heaven. Okay, In the spirit, we will all be under Christ's authority. In the flesh, there is an order. Okay, It is Christ is the head over man, man is the head over the woman. That's the way he set these things up. And it was set up that way by God. I'm sorry if you don't like it. If you don't like it, you need to take it up with him. These people, are, they're going to hear this teaching, and they're going to write me letters and be all angry with me. I've already had people write me upset about this hair length stuff, and they've, they've gotten all upset with me. You can get upset with me all you want, but it's not going to do any good. You need to go to the person who wrote down these instructions, because I didn't write these instructions. In Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him, that's talking about Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So you have to understand, this order of authority was created for the Lord Jesus Christ. They were created by him and for him. And thus, these are things we need to submit to in our lives. Romans 14, verse 11, it says, For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every one of us is going to give an account, and every knee shall bow, and every, every tongue shall confess. Everyone will come under the authority of Christ, so why not do it on our own now? We should please him now by doing that, being under his authority now at this time. Now Paul continues in verse 13, in 1 Corinthians 11 again, we're going back there, in verse 13 he says, Judge in yourselves. So, uh, well, people say, well, uh, no, don't judge anything. Hold on. He says to judge in yourselves. Think about this for a moment. Is it comely that a woman pray to God uncovered? Now, people are going to say, you know, give their yeses or nos back and forth, whatever. But here's what he says after this. He says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Now, here's the problem with that one, first and foremost. When people say nature, they think the animal kingdom immediately. Because after all, the magazine nature, they talk about that stuff. And if there's any shows that are called nature, they're, they're always talking about the animal kingdom. So, you know, they'll see like a show on PBS or something called nature. And then they think, oh, that means animals. Okay, well, wait a second. Nature has quite a few different meanings. The word nature, I mean, you should look that up sometime. Go to Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary and look up the word nature and see all the different definitions of it. The word nature can mean society. Not just nature. There is a nature of animals. There's a nature of plants and things like that. There's a nature in ourselves, a nature of mankind. There's a nature of societies. And so when he says, doth not even nature itself teach you, he's referring to the society in which they live. Because, and that's the only thing it could teach you, that if a man have long hair, it is shame unto him. There is nothing out in nature apart from mankind, meaning that, that like the trees and the birds and the plants and anything, they don't represent man. Okay? Man is a, un is a unique creation of God. The only thing that does represent man is the society in which mankind lives. So, he says, Does not nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Well, what happens in our societies? If the children with a boy that has long hair and stuff like that, he gets it pulled on. And I realize that girls get that too. But you see, the boys will take more ridicule for having long hair. They do that. And the girls, guys, I have seen, you can't tell me otherwise because I've seen that. I remember being in, I think I was in, uh, was I in high school yet? In junior high, I think I was in high school at that point. And one girl 
decided to get her hair cut really short. I mean, really short. Like, I had more hair than she did, okay? I used to have a little bit longer hair myself. But she got... I mean, she was one of the popular girls, and she got made fun of so much. Like, I I felt horrible for her. And this was, you know, this is back before I was saved or anything, but I just felt horrible for her. And because I knew what it was like to be made fun of and beat up and stuff like that all the time. I, I got that all, all the time in, in high school. And I remember just going up behind her and I just said, hey, you know what? I just want to tell you, I think your hair looks really nice. And she lighted up like I've never seen her. This is a person that would never talk to me, okay? But she lighted up so much because I was the only one that would say something like that to her. But anyway, I just remember that. I don't know why I remember that. Anyway, the point is that whether whether or not it was right or not to compliment that, I don't know. But the point is I did it just because I, I hated that she was being picked apart like that. But they do that. Why? Because it's a shame for a woman to have short hair. You see how this works? That's why he's saying your own society teaches you from when you're children that it's a shame for a man to have long hair and it's a shame for women to have short hair. So he's saying that if women, if you're going to have short hair, you might as well just shave it all off. Why not? Because it's pretty much the exact same thing. But you see, the women don't want to do that. And there's there's reasons for that, okay? Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, this is, this is five chapters before what we're reading here. And starting in verse 9, it says, Know ye not the, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, or not, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate shall inherit the kingdom of God. He talks about the effeminate, and that is a male taking on the qualities of a woman. When a man grows his hair out long, he is taking on the qualities that were meant for females, and that's called effeminate. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, apparently, well, God said, well, people says, well, God looks at the heart on things. Yes, he does, but apparently our appearances do have some sort of effect here. Because the effeminate, these are people that are not just acting in an effeminate manner, they're dressing in an effeminate manner. And, and their outward appearance is a reflection of their inward, their inward heart, okay? So we need to keep that in mind, too. That's why Jesus Christ called, called the Pharisees whited sepulchers. He says, you might appear nice on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones, okay? And, but the outside still has appearance. That's why he says, if you clean the inside of the cup and the platter, the outside will also be clean. So the outside is a reflection of what's in our hearts, but in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. Now, when people want to say, Oh, but it's just talking about covering. It's not talking about hair. Then why does he mention here hair here for a covering? It's giving the very context of what's being talked about here. This is talking about the length of your hair. It says, If a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. But for her hair, but for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, now, when it says glory, in this context, it's talking about beauty. That's why it's a glory to her. That's why people, men and women alike find, you know, when, when a woman has really beautiful hair, men and women alike both find that to be beautiful. Not just one, okay? Because it's given to her as a beauty. And Paul mentions, you know, people, they start to ask questions like, well, what kind of hair length is acceptable then? Well, first of all, I would say your hair length ought to be able to cover your head. Because that's what it's talking about here. It's given to you for a covering over your over your head, which is for not just for the authority, but a covering for your head itself. So it should be, co- ever be able to cover your whole head long enough for that. But also, Paul mentions braided hair length for women. Now, look at this. In 1 Timothy 2.9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair. Broided hair means that's braided. That's what we say, we know today is braided. The word plating or plated hair also means braided. In 1 Peter 3, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, Likewise likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they uh, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the uh, hair, plating the hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be hidden, the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Now the meek and quiet spirit, I didn't say that it was a great price to men. I said that was a great price to God, that he says that, okay? I'm not saying that you can never braid your hair, okay? 
But what they're doing is they're going as an outward appearance to the world to braid their hair, to make themselves a beauty to the world. And that's what he's saying, it is better as a greater price to God of a, of a meek and a quiet spirit to focus on those things. So if you're going to braid your hair, you have to have it long enough to braid. So I would say if your hair is long enough that you can braid it, it's probably about the right length, acceptable length to God, okay? So basically, if you go about shoulder length, you're probably okay. I'm, that's just my opinion. The Bible doesn't say that. I'm just giving, I'm, based on what I'm reading here, that sounds about reasonable. And is that, I mean, the question then comes, is that such a hard thing to do? And why are there so many people that rebel against this stuff? I don't know. But this is not a difficult thing. So the, the last verse here that he talks about this, this subject is in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, And it says, But if any man seem to be contentious, we have so no, uh, no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, let me explain this because there are people that take this one way off topic too. There's uh, one guy that I've listened to who, he's, he's a preacher, he's got long hair, and he tries to justify it, and he, sa he says in verse 16, he points out verse 16, and he says, ah, you're not supposed to argue against me or you're being contentious. That is not what that's saying. What Paul just did was gave the commandment that men, from the Lord Jesus Christ, men are supposed to have short hair, women are supposed to have long hair. And it says, but if any man seem to be contentious, we have so not, no such custom in the churches of God. Meaning that the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are not contentious over these issues. Which means if someone is going to rebel against that and try to argue with people over it, they are the, the ones with the, the men with the long hair and the women with the short hair that are going to fight over this issue and try to argue with people, they are being contentious, and we have no such custom in the church, which means they are not worthy of being in the church of Christ, and we need to sanctify ourselves from them. I'm not saying you need to sanctify yourself and not talk to anybody if a man has long hair or a woman has short hair. I'm not saying that. I'm saying if they are claiming to be brethren in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will not put themselves under his authority, they want to reject them, reject that authority, then we ought to sanctify ourselves from them. I realize that people have to learn about this stuff. I mean, there's all sorts of people. There's, I guarantee you there will be women who will listen to this who have short hair who are just learning about this subject. It's not like you can change that overnight. You have to have to take time to grow your hair out, okay? I'm talking about the people that try to make excuses and justifications for this stuff. But men, on the other hand, can change it overnight. You can be like, man, give me a pair of scissors. We're going to fix this problem right now, okay? But I understand. Now, for men that, that have long hair. I understand you would have an excuse if we learned, lived in a world where there were no sharp objects like knives or, or scissors or anything like that, and, and you couldn't get access to anything like that. I could understand some lengthy hair, okay? But since we don't live in that type of dimension where there is no such thing, and we do live in a world where there are scissors, then the problem is in your heart, okay? The problem is not anything outward. It's not within the interpretations of the Word of God or anything. Paul made this abundantly clear if we read it slowly. But you see, they don't want to read it slowly. They want an excuse to do the things they want to do because they don't love the things of God. And they definitely don't love the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And really, this is not a difficult issue. If someone's going to be contentious over something so simple to do, they have no business in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? This is one of the easiest things there is to do. I mean, we've, got, we've gone through a lot of difficulties. You guys have talked to me all the difficulties about letting go of, of celebrations like Christmas, which many of us have loved since we were children, and letting go of all sorts of these wicked things of the world and having to change things over. The hair length should be the least among them. But I've seen some of the most vicious fighting come out of it. But anyway, continuing here, there was a, an article that Lorraine had actually shared one time that she had found about how there were, it was a, a pastor in Kenya, in South Africa. They t he told the women in his church not to wear underwear so that they could receive the Holy Spirit. It's unbelievable that he would tell them to do something like that and that they would come in without any underwear dressed the way they were dressed was unbelievable. See, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Well, if women are supposed to adorn themselves in modest apparel, that's not modest, okay? Now, for women out there, I want to, I want to make this point very clear, or for men and women. You see, because if, if a woman... Well, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's, let's, I'll, I'll save that for a minute later. But if you, if you had women walking into a church building dressed like that, 
most of you women immediately would address them on that and said, whoa, 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 you need to go get covered up right now. If you would address a woman about that right there, but you would not address a man when he walks in with long hair or a woman when she walks in with short hair, then you are a hypocrite, okay? Because you're willing to address one thing, but you're not willing to address another, okay? Which means you yourself are making an excuse. I should not be the only person who is addressing this. I know I'm not, okay? There are other people out there that are trying to address this issue, um, with the truth and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they are far and few between from what I'm seeing. What I see is that even somebody who's trying to say, well, yeah, the command of God says this, but if you do it, I guess that's okay. I see those kind of things written all the time. I checked out many different websites, and I want to see what certain people were teaching on this issue, and I'll give you some examples of those in just a few minutes. But you see, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23, it says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as, as, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. So what he's telling them there is that rebellion and stubbornness is just like witchcraft and idolatry and paganism. The sins are exactly the same, according to the Lord God. And so if you're rebelling against simple things like the hair length, uh, in the Bible, you're rebelling against the authority over your head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you are not going to hell because you didn't cut your hair the right way. Okay, You don't go to hell because you drank alcohol. You don't go to hell because you celebrated Christmas. But these actions reject the authority of Christ over our lives. If we're his children, he will chasten us for those things. And with chastening comes punishment. Because in Revelation 3.19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And if, but if he doesn't chasten you, listen up to Hebrews 12, 8. It says, but if ye be without chastisements, whereof all, ye are, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You are not the children of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not the children of God. And you are not a born-again Christian, it's saying here, if you are without chastisement. So we need to be chastised by the Lord God. And, we, and if you're not being chastened by the Lord God, then watch out. You need to be careful, okay? In Jeremiah 28, 16, it says, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest this people to trust in a lie. You see, you have people that are going to teach and make you to trust in lies to give themselves a justification for what they do. And it continues and says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. See, they're teaching a lie for people to trust in a lie, and they're teaching rebellion against the Lord God. Now, for example, there's a website called godsword.org, and a lot of these apostate websites, they have all sorts of, of really appealing titles to people. Oh, someplace, someplace called God's Word, there's no way they could teach anything that isn't God's Word. Well, let's listen to what this guy named uh, Tony uh, Scaldone had said in an article he called, uh, Should Christian Women Have Long Hair? He said, quote, Paul's instruction had nothing to do with cutting your hair. Now, before I even continue, what did we just read? We just read Paul directly telling us that men should have short hair and women should have long hair. Well, if it's not, it has nothing to do with cutting hair, what are you supposed to just will it back into your head, men, if that's the case? You know, is that what you're supposed to do? Are you just supposed to tuck it in? Is that, is that how that works? He says, Paul's instruction had nothing to do with cutting your hair and everything to do with living in Corinth. Paul didn't teach that women should have, lo have long hair. He taught, as was the custom of the day, that women should cover their heads while praying or prophesying, end quote. So you can see that he totally ignored the verses where it, where it referenced and showed that the covering he was talking about was their hair. That's clear as day if you read it slowly. But, he, I mean, he wants to claim that Paul didn't teach anything on these things. I mean, this is preposterous. You have to take these verses way out of their context to come to that conclusion. Now, another strategy this guy Tony uses is common among those who try to justify their long hair, or men with long hair and women with short hair. They always refer back to the Nazarite vow. And this is one that many of you who have studied on this topic have heard this excuse a number of times. Now, on his website, he referred, they actually have the wrong reference to Scripture. I, know, I, I looked it up and I found them, because he uses a New Age Bible too, so I had to hunt down what he was referring to. But he's actually trying to quote from Numbers chapter 6. And in verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, 
I'm sorry, who did it, who was it say it was talking to? Israel. Oh, okay, so so this was speaking to the children of Israel and saying unto them. Okay, I just want to make sure we knew who we were talking to, okay? I know people always say, well, Chris, you're being a little sarcastic. Well, sometimes if people aren't getting the point, okay, they're not reading this slowly enough to take it into consideration. He sa It continues and says, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, all the days of the vow of his separation shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled, in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy, and shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. So here's the argument. Because Nazarites in, in Numbers chapter six here, because Nazarites took a vow unto God. All right, and the Nazarites, by the way, were the children of Israel, they're the Jews. Because Nazarites took a vow unto God, where women shaved their heads at the beginning and end of the vow, therefore Christian women can have short hair. And because men well, they're not supposed to take a razor to their head. Therefore, men can have long hair. It, to me, it doesn't seem like people are looking for a Bible study as much as they're looking for an excuse, a justification. Because not one of the people that will make these arguments, I mean, somebody tries to say, well, they, they took the Nazarite vows and they had long hair. Here's the first question you can ask them. Did you take a Nazarite vow? Uh, No. Because if they were to take a Nazarite vow, they would have shaved their heads to begin with. Anyway, these guys that have all this, you know, long hippie hair, they would have shaved their heads to begin with, and they'll never do such a thing. And, and they cut it on a regular basis, too, by the way. Oh, they, you forget that. You see, they have long hair, but they'll only let it grow to a certain point. They will still go into a hairdresser and have them cut it to trim it, okay, even though they were not supposed to take a razor to their head at all. Everything about the Nazarite vow makes no sense to these guys that have long hair today. Right? These are false teachers that are willing to deceive to give these men and women justification. The Nazarite vow was a specific vow that was done by the Jews in sanctifying themselves away from sin and temptation that were being set apart wholly to God. It was a sanctification ritual that they did. The rest of society did not operate according to the rules of the Nazarites. So there's two points to consider here. Number one, Paul does not refer to the Nazarite vow anywhere in 1 Corinthians 11. Let me repeat that one more time. Paul does not refer to the Nazarite vow anywhere in 1 Corinthians 11. Nowhere. Number two, Jews that took the Nazarite vow only did so for a limited time. That was, and that's why it says in Numbers chapter 6, until the days be fulfilled. And then they cut their hair as normal afterwards. Now, they'll argue, they say, well, Paul took a Nazarite vow. Yeah, but Paul was Jewish. Duh. Okay, let's go to Acts 18.18. 18. It says, And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Kentria, for he had a vow. Now, that's all it said, for he had a vow. Some people is like to say, well, this doesn't point to the Nazarite vow, so it's not a Nazarite vow. I would say, mm, I don't think that's the case. I think it is a Nazarite vow, because there's no other vow in Scripture that begins with shaving your head like that. So I would have to say this is talking about the Nazarite vow. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far to say that it wasn't, even though it's not mentioned specifically. But... Anyway, this vow was a sign for the Jews he was preaching to at Ephesus, because that's where he was going. The vow w also would have a time limit to it. After the vow was over, Paul would keep his hair short as he was taught, as, and the same as he taught to the church in Corinth. He wasn't just going to let his hair grow out and tell all of them, you need to cut your hair. That, that's hypocritical, okay? And so he kept his hair short in submission to God outside of the Nazarite vow. And that's, and that's why he said in 1 Corinthians 11, in chapter, starting in verse 1 again, <clears throat> I'm going to repeat this one more time. It says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. The head of every man is Christ. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head uncovered, dishonor this head. Or having, excuse me, having his head covered, dishonor this head. So if you're praying and prophesying with your head, head covered with long hair, outside of a Nazarite vow then you are dishonoring the Lord Jesus Christ. So, 
I'd like to point out also, because here's the thing. They said, well, it's not talking about hair. Well, you still have a covering. If you, if as a man you have a long hair, you have a covering. And so that's not what you're supposed to do, okay? I do also want to point out that Paul never mentioned how long he took that Nazarite vow. It just said that you don't bring a razor to your head for as long as you have that vow. And you're supposed to set the time of the vow when you do it. Okay, if you go into all the details of the Nazarite vow in the Bible, you'll see you're supposed to set a time limit on this. Now, the time limit could be a week. It could be a month. It could be a year. It could be your entire lifetime, as we'll see later when we get to actual Samson. And people are like, are you going to cover Samson? Not very much. Maybe really quickly at the end of this, because Samson doesn't really have anything to do with this. And I'll show you. But here, there's a guy by the name of Danny Bunn, and he had emailed me once talking about you know stuff he saw on our website and things like that. And Because he liked my website, because he, he does a lot of preaching, but he's a long-haired preacher, and he liked a lot of our preaching. But then when I saw his videos, I told him, I was like, look, you need to cut your hair. And he got really upset because he's like, "Don't nobody tells me to cut my hair, you know, because he's had other people do this and that kind of thing before. But he has a video of, of where, because he sent me, well, I did a whole teaching on this. His teaching is ridiculous. I have the references for his teaching here on the website next to his picture. You can see it for yourself. If you really want to see it for yourself, go look it up. Just copy and paste that link into a, that's how you can t- check that out. Copy that link, paste it into something, and you can watch the video for yourself. I watched about 20 minutes of it, and I shut it off. I said, this is the most ridiculous arguments I have ever heard on a subject. You should see the kind of st- stuff that he does. But, you know, one of the things he does in the video, if you if you watch it, he opens with pictures of a long-haired boy. It might be his son or something like that. It, this boy has long hair, and it's got a bunch of secular rock music in the background. See, this guy is a hippie Christian rocker. I went to his website. I checked it out. He's got all sorts of wicked people and they're like Alice Cooper, all sorts of wicked, satanic, demonic music on his so-called Christian preaching page. I mean, what does that tell you? He's got a lot of stuff on there he shouldn't have on there at all. But anyway, he starts off by saying, quote, Salvation is in Jesus Christ, not in any other kind of issue. It's in him. When you're truly born again of his spirit, he'll make you a new creature, end quote. And that is true for 2 Corinthians 5, 17. says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. But you see, Danny doesn't want to walk in the newness of Christ. Neither does Tony, we just mentioned earlier, apparently. Okay, They don't want to walk in the newness of Christ, nor be just subjected to Christ's authority over their lives. They want to live the way they want to live, do whatever they want to do, and then say they're of God. I don't know whether they're saved or not. I don't, I don't know enough about them to know that one way or another, but I do know they're rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Colossians 2.6, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 8, it says, For ye were sometimes of darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. We see they're not proving what's acceptable to the Lord by going over and listening to what Paul told us about that. They're looking for some loophole, some thing that they can pull out, which is why they bring up the Nazarite vow. They're looking for something that can tell them, they, they can justify them in their rebellion against Christ's authority over their lives. See, they want they want to they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want all all of Christ's blessings. They want his salvation. They want all this stuff, but then they want to turn around and live like the devil. It doesn't work like that. Okay? We come to the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from the wrath of come and repentance. Alright? But in Psalm uh, chapter four, verse two, it says, Oh ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity? You see, he walks around with his long hair, this Danny Bun guy walks around with his long hair, but then he you know, he's glorying in his shame. He thinks it's so great for him to have this long hair. He glories in his shame. And Philippians 3, verse 19, it says, Whose end is in destruction, whose God is in their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. They are still minding the earthly things and claiming they're of Christ. Now, there's a number of things in Danny's teaching, and I'm not going to quote you guys uh, like even on the article itself when I did this and again if you want to f- I, I didn't mention at the beginning I'm sorry if you want to check out this article and see all the references to everything I'm giving on here you go into creationliberty.com just type in the word hair and you'll find the teaching you know hair, uh, hair length in the Bible it'll talk about that but the, in Danny's teaching I don't really quote from his teaching much I did provide the link to it and, and if you want to see what I'm talking about on there then go and type in that li- put in that link just copy and paste that in there 
But the reason I didn't quote from it much is because his speaking, you'll see when you watch the video, his speaking is so sporadic. It's difficult to pull out a definite quotation. He also slurs a lot. It's difficult to understand him. So I really couldn't pull out some definite quotations, but I'll just, I'll just talk about some of the things that he teaches. For example, he quotes a man who wrote him, explained to Danny what I had just covered, what we just talked about from 1 Corinthians 11, okay, about a line from the authority from God. You know, there's, it's, it's God is the top authority, and then Christ, you know, God is over Christ, Christ is over man, man is over woman. Okay, that's the line of authority. He quoted from this guy, and it was so sad is that this guy that was writing him, when I listened to some of the things he said in his letter, the guy that wrote him didn't know much of what he was talking about either. So when you have two people that don't have any understanding of the scripture that they're talking about bicker amongst themselves, it's really frustrating to listen to, and you really want to go do something more productive with your time. That's really how I feel about the situation. But anyhow, this, and you guys saw that clearly, where, I mean, that's exactly what Paul had said there. Let me go back to that real quick in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Hang on. But he says, But I would have you know, and this is in verse 3, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So it gives us the order right there. When Danny had said that, when he was doing his teaching, and he said that this guy told him that in the letter, Danny says, Well, I didn't figure that out. That's a direct quote from him. I didn't figure that out. In context, what he's saying is he had no understanding of what that guy was talking about. That's directly what verse 3 says. But he doesn't have any understanding of it. But he is, I mean, he is anointed enough and, and knows enough to be able to teach on the matter. But he has no idea what Paul is even talking about. He can read it directly and can't even see what it says because he's blinded to it. The only reason he'd be blinded is if he's rebelling against the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ is not opening his eyes. And part of the reason he's doing that is because he likes to keep his long hair and listen to his wicked rock music. He also starts out by arguing that there's a missionary. He, he named some famous missionary that went to China. I had never heard of the guy before. But he says this famous missionary to China, he let his hair grow out in order to evangelize to all these people out in China. Well, first of all, Danny is not preaching to the Chinese. I don't see him going out and evangelizing to the Chinese. So what does that have to do with Danny's long hair? He also gives all sorts of credentials about this evangelist and said, oh, preachers and pastors, they really respect this guy. I don't care who preachers and pastors respect because that's respecting a person's, okay, which is sin according to the Bible. We're not supposed to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with respect to persons, okay? And he's saying this evangelist highly respected among preachers, and he went to go, he, he grew out his hair long because the, the Chinese, apparently they had their top knots, and they wouldn't listen to him because he didn't have a top knot to have long hair, so he grew his hair long. Okay, so because this evangelist, first of all, is highly respected among men, is that, is that, you know, is this evangelist your final authority in all matters of faith and practice? That's why you grow your hair long? Not the Bible, but him. I never, I don't know whether, I mean, because I can say, with confidence that when he grew his hair long, he was not supposed to do that. To reach these, I mean, that that's going against the word of God. You see, you have to understand, if, I mean, I had a, okay, let's, let's talk about it this way. I had a guy a long time ago write me and tell me that he had a friend who would go to people when he was evangelizing and he would buy a, pack, a, a case of beer and he would hand them each a beer, like he would go to the homeless, hand them a beer, and then sit down with them and talk with them about Jesus. And I said, I said, your friend is a hypocrite. I said, you can't sit down and properly preach the truth of the word. Because if you're going to actually present the gospel properly, you need to give the law so they can be converted. How can you give the law when you're breaking the law when approaching them to give them the law? They're going to notice you a hypocrite immediately. And the world's going to reject you. Okay? So that, I mean, we don't sin and rebel against Christ in order to teach them about Christ. That's not how we operate, folks. Paul went and shaved his head and had a, had a Nazarite vow in order to preach to Ephesus, okay? But you see, that was, that was established in their society. That was already established by God. Not just their society, but God had already established that Nazarite vow among the Jews. He did not establish a long-haired topknot to the Chinese. 
So going them to, to preach to them the law while being a rejection of the authority of Christ over your head is a total contradiction. And you're not going to get people saved that way. All right? You're going to lead them into a false, I mean, false understanding. Even if they were to be born again somehow through that type of preaching, then they're going to think what you do is acceptable to God. Okay, and then whatever they choose to do, that they can come and do whatever sin they want in order to reach people with the gospel. This is the total opposite of what we're, we're supposed to understand in Christ's doctrine. Okay? Uh, I, I once had somebody write me, uh, trying to justify his supposed Christian rock music in quotations. I asked him if, if he wanted to reach witches with the gospel of Christ. And if he, you know, let's say you know you want to reach a witch with the gospel of Christ, so you adopt witchcraft, you dress like them, you start going through their seances, you participate in them in order to reach them. Would that be acceptable to God? You know what he told me? Yes, that's acceptable to God, he says, but someone like you just wouldn't understand. And started calling me a Pharisee and all sorts of other stuff like that. He's, these people believe that you can sin in order to reach people with the gospel, and that's okay with God. Unbelievable! They think they can live like the devil and use God as an excuse to do it. Okay, I mean, how far does this go? If you want to reach someone in a nudist colony to tell them, "Hey, you're supposed to be dressing modestly. You're not supposed to be walking around." Do you go nude yourself and just go into a nudist colony to tell them how their nudity is wrong? You're a hypocrite. This is—it's not hard to understand. Okay, did Danny Bunn take a Nazarite vow? No. He didn't take a Nazarite vow, so why does he have long hair? See, he uses that Nazarite He tries to justify himself using, saying, oh, with the Nazarite vow, they did that so I can have long hair. He never took a Nazarite vow. Then Danny claims that God doesn't look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. Well, that's true, okay? Let's go to John chapter 7 real quick in verse 24. It says, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what that says. See, Danny throws this verse at those who question his rebellious long hair. He's applying John 7.24 in this instance out of complete ignorance and willful ignorance, I suspect, since we're talking about someone, he, I mean, he preaches on a regular basis. So, anyway, I'll show you how he's completely nonsensical in what he's approaching here. If you will go back, and like we've been doing, you know, like I, I go back to 1 Corinthians 11, start in verse 1, we walk it through. Let's go back to the paragraph in John 24. Let's go back to verse 18, and let's read this slowly. So in John 7, the Jews came to accuse Christ, and they wanted to kill him for his preaching. And he said to them, My doctrine is not mine. This is verse 18. My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So he wasn't preaching of himself. You know, like how Danny is preaching of himself, he's trying to justify himself. Christ was not trying to justify himself in anything. So there's, you know, the first point where he's off scripture. Second, Christ pointed out their hypocrisy, okay? So in John 7.20, it says, Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? The people answered and says, Thou hast a devil who, who goeth about to kill thee. See, the Jews were judging by the appearance, thinking that he was doing works of wonders because he was possessed by a devil. So they were judging according to the appearance. They were not judging in righteousness according to righteous judgment. In John 7.22, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses, but of our fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Well, now stop and consider that for a moment. If they circumcised on the eighth day, which is, by the way, even scientifically, that is the, the, the only safe day to really do that. Because there's so much blood, um, the different vitamins that, that the body needs for a child to produce blood are on the eighth day. They're at their highest peak on the eighth day. So that's why they, he, told, he told them to do it on the eighth day. But when you do it on the eighth day, you can't avoid, eventually you're going to get to a point where you can't avoid the Sabbath, which means you're doing work on the Sabbath day. See? So they were not ke keeping the commandments of God, but, Christ, but they were accusing Christ of not keeping them. That's called hypocritical judgment in Matthew chapter 7. So in John 7, 23, it says, If a man on the Sabbath day re receives circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? 
You see, he was doing works of righteousness within the doctrines of the law and prophets. He hadn't actually done anything wrong. So from his appearance, they should have judged according, according to, if they were actually judging according to, truly to his appearance, because he was appearing to do works of righteousness, which means he was of God. But let's say Christ would have went out to preach. He got drunk first and then went out to preach. Then they would have had proper grounds to accuse him because he was not following the, following the righteousness of God. And his preaching would have been ineffective. But these people were not judging him according to his, to his righteous actions he was doing. They were judging according to how they wanted to see things by the appearance, right? Thus he said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now in Danny's situation, we have a preacher directly rebelling against Christ's doctrine with his appearance, then telling people not to judge him according to the appearance. But the appearance that he's portraying is unrighteous rebellion. That's not the appearance Christ was giving in this moment. What Christ was giving was proper works that led the appearance of that he was from God. That's the interpretation they should have had. They judged by the appearance of, well, we don't want to believe you're of God. That was their presupposition, that he was not of God. So they then concluded, well, he's of a, he must have a devil. That's how he's working all these wonders. And that's why he says, judge not appearance, but judge righteous judgment. When you're judging the appearance, you judge righteously of the appearance. And Danny's appearance is of unrighteousness that rebels against Christ. But you see, Danny doesn't understand any of those scriptures. He's blinded to that because he's rebelling against Christ. So I'm not saying that you're like, Chris, you're claiming that you know Danny's heart. No, I'm telling you that if you clean the inside of the cup and platter, the outside will also be clean. And if the outside's not clean, you haven't cleaned the inside yet. And that's how I know Danny's heart is because outwardly, he's already showing me signs of unrighteousness that he needs to clean up. He needs to be rebuked. He needs to repent of that stuff. And I tried to rebuke him, but he won't even speak with me anymore. He won't. He doesn't want to talk to me anymore. I've already had personal email correspondence with the guy. And it's, it's so irritating me because I have people, you know, when I say this stuff and I point out these people, they said, well, did you contact this person? You know, the first thing I tell them in email whenever they tell me that, I said, did you? Because when they're writing me, asking me if I contacted that person, see, I'm the one that's up here writing. I'm in contact with these people. I'm doing the work. I'm writing these teachings. I'm making them. I'm looking at the scriptures, helping people understand it. All they're doing is coming in to critique it. They have done nothing. Most of the people that write me that stuff, I'm not saying all of them, but 99% of them that write me something, did you contact this person all that? They don't lift a finger to do anything for the gospel of Christ. Nothing. But they want to question the people that do. Because, again, they don't like it. See, there's something about the teaching that is offending them. It's something about the teaching that they don't like. It's something about God's word that they don't want to hear. And that's why they come at me with all these railing accusations. And I was even talking with you guys before we started today about some of, that, some of the emails that I'd gotten with the same kind of thing. Is that they get upset because there's something about the teaching they don't like. Something personally in their hearts they're trying to justify to make an excuse. So Danny's not preaching of the Father in heaven. He's preaching of himself. He's speaking of himself and try, in his own imagined glory and trying to justify his own, his own self. You see, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, it says in Proverbs 15.10. And in Proverbs 9.8, he says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. See, the, the scorner is going to hate thee when you rebuke them. But 1 Timothy 5.20 says, Then that, that sin rebuke before all so that others may fear. I am showing you this and showing you and doing this publicly because he won't listen to me. So I'm going to show the church as a whole. You guys need to fear this issue because we need to fear the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to fear God. That's what this issue about is about hair. Okay, And that's why I made this demotivational poster about rock beat scissors. I mean, if you go to some sort of like Woodstock hippie concert, all you need to do is hold up your fist everywhere and you will win every single game of rock, paper, scissors because they all hold up their scissor signs everywhere. I know that's the, that's the peace sign. I'm aware. I'm aware it's also wicked in its origin. I'm aware of that. Okay, it's a joke. But anyway, it's to get people. I thought people would pass this around a little more, but I have very few people that share our demotivational. Uh, there's people that say, wow, I really like these, but very few people actually share them. And it took me a while of thinking about it, why that is. Why would so many people tell me they like them, but then not share them very much? And part of the reason is, is because they know it's going to offend other people. And so because, well, some numbers might go down on my friends list if I, if I post this, they get too afraid to do it. 
And you see, that's and, and, and there's so many people that sit there and say, "Well, I've got so many friends on Facebook." No, you don't. You have people on a list that is called friends in quotation. That doesn't mean you have friends on Facebook. Okay. I have very few, very very few friends on Facebook. I have hundreds of people on the list that want to connect to me, but I have very few friends. And that's where we need to make a distinction between those two things. There's so many people diluted into that. Anyway, continuing, the point being is that in Luke 16, 15, it says, And ye are they that justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And then the, and then the people with the long hair sit back and say, Well, don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge me in these things. Well, again, go to our website, type in the word judge in the search bar, creationliberty.com, and read the article called Unbiblical cop Outs Don't Judge Me. Because, yes, God says that you're supposed to judge and that there is no... I mean, the Bible tells us, if you will go and look at the Scripture... I have the Scripture on our website, okay? The Bible tells us there is no salvation without judgment. There has to be judgment and righteousness, okay? Because that's how we hear the law. So anyway, I'm going to, because we're running out of time here, I'm going to skip through some of this. Here's another ministry called Barnabas Ministries, which has an article, because their their website is BibleStudy.org. Oh, we're going to do a real Bible study here. Yeah, right. In an article they called, Does the Bible Say Women Should Wear Only Long Hair? And folks, I'm, I mean, I don't mean to be that, I mean, you hear a lot of that frustration coming out of me when I talk about some of these websites. And that's because, I, folks, I really can't for hardly find a ministry I could recommend to you. Probably, I would say, the, the only one at this point that I would really fully recommend to somebody would be Scott Johnson's Contending for Truth. I mean, that's the only other one I can find, because I can't hardly find any of them that there's always somebody that's making an excuse and justification for sin and for wickedness, okay? Scott Johnson, I don't see him doing any of that. Now, I don't agree with him on everything. Like, nine, there's probably 0.01% things he would teach that I would definitely disagree with him on. And I thought, wait a second, you, whoa, you are getting way off base on that one. But you see, they are so minor and so far and few between. Because this guy does not make a justification for sin or for wickedness, he sanctifies himself properly, and that type of person is so incredibly rare, it's, it's difficult to find. I've had people, and I'll probably have people later after they hear this, send me stuff. Oh, Chris, you should look at this ministry. You should look at this one. I have had people send me places. I go and look, with, look at them, and I find leaven within them. Within anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds, I've already found leaven. And then I sit back and think, why is it other people cannot see the leaven in this? And but you see his his ministry I would I would probably recommend to people, uh, but not too many beyond that because there's so many that make excuses and even if there's some that don't make excuses for sin, I found that they don't rebuke properly either. What they do is they they'll start playing favorites. I start to watch them. I've had conversations with some. I've watched them do this. They'll start playing favorites. If somebody follows their ministry, they're they're extremely light on these people. They don't rebuke them properly, okay, with the scripture. But then if it's someone who doesn't follow their ministry, they they they're like, oh well, you know, you should fix that. You should get this right and things like that. Yeah, they'll do that. But any of the followers, they they get really light on and that kind of thing. And so I've seen them do that kind of stuff to where they're not. They seem to just, they're trying to build a popularity in this. I'm not saying you have to be mean to everybody, but you should be consistent. That's what I'm talking about. Be consistent among people. And if your consistency, you find that you're not being patiently, properly with all men, then there's your problem. You need to learn that patience, okay? If you're finding that, if you're being consistent and you're finding that, that you're being just, oh, we're just, we're going to be politically correct, nice to everybody, then there's your problem right there. You need to learn how to be able to rebuke properly. So that you're going to find, if you're consistent in all bases, then you're going to find, you're, you might end up finding some problems. And that's how you can locate certain things. I'm sorry, I'm getting off topic there. there, there there's a lot we could talk about on that. But I want to talk about this uh, Barnabas Ministries and see what they said. There's a question they posed. It says, question, quote, why do some women wear only long hair to, to church, and if a, another woman comes in with short hair, they, re, they really make them feel uncomfortable? Answer, I am just as frustrated as you in regards to people judging others, whether it is, it is their hair or their clothing, or even how they behave before they get to know the individual and understand why or who they are. Wearing, their hair, wearing hair shorter or longer is a matter of personal choice. 
If you feel uncomfortable, get away from those who make you feel that way or reassess why you do. Try asking them why they treat you differently, end quote. Well, let me quote you 1 Corinthians chapter 2, okay? Same book we were going over from 1 Corinthians 11. This is chapter 2, and starting in verse 14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Okay? So we are supposed to judge these matters in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, but these people who rebel against Christ, they, don't, they, don't, they can't see any of it. Because they're foolishness to him, because they're they're discerned through the Spirit of God. Okay, now I want to what he said. Well, if they have short hair, maybe you should get to know them. Let me ask you a question. Any of you guys, any of you ladies out there, let me ask you guys a question. I want you to imagine that a teenage girl walks. You know, you're attending a church building. She walks into this church building in her underwear, in some you know really lacy underwear. She walks in. What would you do? I'd like kick her out until I get clothes on. <laughs> yeah, or somebody might even go to. Maybe I would try to, you know, take my jacket off and and cover her, yeah, right? That'd be better. But like, you need to go put some clothes on. Or here, maybe some of us have some extra clothes you can borrow. But that would be the first thing you guys would do. Why? Because she's immodestly dressed. Okay, she is not right with the word of God when she's walking in there, correct? And you're rebuking her, right? And setting her straight on the word. Now, I want you to imagine that a man, but you know, like let's say say one of you guys was going to take your jacket off and cover her up, or one of your ladies were going to do that, and some man steps in between you and her and says, wait, 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 wait. I think we should get to know her first. What would be your impression at that point? What's your impression of this guy? It's okay, you can say it. I know what you're thinking. Maybe he's kind of perverted. Yeah, that he's a pervert. That would be the first thing that come across my head. Was, what is wrong with you? Get out of the way. The reason you're doing that... Now, why is it... Can you guys give me a reason why you immediately go to your mind that this guy's a pervert? Well, why else would you want to stop someone from you know, getting her covered? Why would you justify her? Right. Isn't that what you're just saying right now? Why would you? Why else would you justify her? Because there's wickedness in his heart, and that's the reason he's trying to justify her. Let me ask this. Let's say we set her down. She tells us her life story. Does that make her a modestly dressed person or nudity, does that make that okay after we get to know her? Not at all. So why does he say here, this guy from this Barnabas ministry says, well, maybe you should get to know this person. And that suddenly makes their short hair, or the women's short hair, or the men's long hair, that suddenly makes it acceptable to God? How does that make sense? Getting to know someone, okay, if you got to know a murderer, does that mean that his murder was acceptable? If you get to know a thief, does that make all the things he stole belong to him? I mean, this is preposterous. But you see, this is how they answer things from the New Age church unity. They want to deceive you into a lie. Because they serve not the Lord Jesus Christ. They serve their own belly. They're trying to make a guruship out of themselves to where everybody needs to come to them to ask these questions. You guys have the same anointing I do. You can read the scripture for yourself and understand it as well. And you see, your reactions and understanding of this is just the same as mine and the same as anybody else's. But you see, they will use anything, no matter how illogical, in order to try to justify their wickedness and their rebellion against Christ. And you see, this is how people, many, most people, are in their hearts. Not, that, not the way that they, you see, remember what Jesus Christ said, judge not according to the appearance. Because they go to a church building, because they dress up in their best Sunday clothes and go in there, and they're so nice and welcoming to you, and they give you a bulletin and ask how you're doing and talk about the weather, just because they seem so nice does not mean they're right with the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're not supposed to judge by the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Isaiah 59, in verse 12, it says, For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. If our transgressions are with us, we're walking in and we're doing wickedness against God, then that is a testimony against us in the position that we are not following the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not following the Lord God. It continues and says, Yea, truly faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. 
I'm sorry, did it displease him that there was lots of judgment? No, it displeased him that there was no judgment. The people were not judging in righteousness. You see, the point that is that the argument that these men are making on all these different websites is unbiblical and illogical. And if someone is doing wickedness in the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ, getting to know their personal character does not justify their wickedness. Should we not biblically judge Satan because we didn't get to know Satan first? I mean, don't we need to sit down and have a conversation with him before we can judge whether or not he's, he's, he's okay? If we have some friendly chats with Satan, will that make all of his actions justified about him deceiving the world? Now, this is the last part we're going to do, and then we'll stop for today. Okay, Samson is another justification. People go, well, Samson had his hair long, and God blessed him. In Judges sixteen seventeen, There hath not come a razor upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. His mother was a Nazarite. She took a Nazarite vow, and, and she gave him to God to be a Nazarite for his whole life. It says, if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me. And that's what he told them. See, the apostate website, there's one, there's an apostate website called Metal for Jesus. It's one of these Christian rockers, again, trying to justify all his wickedness from this guy named uh, Johannes jo uh, Johnson, whose sole purpose is to justify rock music. And in his, uh, concerning long hair, this is what he wrote, quote, Samson was a Nazarite from the moment he was born. He let his hair grow and didn't cut it. To sum it up, we can see that God have that God have nothing, I think he meant to say has, but this, I just copy and pasted it from his website. To sum it up, we can see that God has nothing against men having long hair. So if you want to look real metal, as, as do as the Nazarites, grow your, hair, grow your hair out and grow it long, end quote. Oh man, you've got to look metal like the Nazarites. This is unbelievable. I mean, just like with Danny Bunn, who also attempts to use, he uses Samson to justify his long hair too. This Johannes Johnson has, has not taken a Nazarite vow, neither did Danny Bunn, neither did any of these other guys. None of them took a Nazarite vow, vow from birth. The story of Samson has nothing to do with this issue. It's not mentioned to Christians anywhere in 1 Corinthians 11. Never once did Paul bring up Samson. He didn't bring up the Nazarite vow, none of that in context. But you see, they realize, ooh, this is a quick one-liner I can give to justify rebelling against the authority of Christ. And other Christians that don't actually study their Bibles are just going to believe me. Because after all, that quick one-liner, it's, it's a McDonald's drive through Bible study. Give it to me fast, give it to me now so I can go home and watch TV. The bottom line is this. If you're a man and want to have long hair, no one's stopping you from doing so. Okay, I'm not the final judge. You don't have to answer to me. You don't have to write me trying to justify yourself. You see, I'm not the final judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is. The Lord God is. And, well, if you're not saved, it's a great white throne judgment. The Lord God's your final judge. You've got to answer to him. Okay? And I'm not saying if the world wants to go out and men have long hair and women have short hair, they're, the, they're of the world, guys. This is what we expect of them. But for us that are born again, we should walk in the newness of the Spirit. Okay? And we should live the way we say we believe. So if you're a man, you want to have long hair, no one's stopping you from doing so. But if you're a Christian man, born again in Christ, there will be chastening from God on issues like this. If you're a woman and you want to have short hair, no one's stopping you from doing that. But if you're a Christian woman, born again in Christ, there will be chastening from God on issues like this. If you want to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ, do what's pleasing to him. Not what's pleasing to yourself or what's pleasing to, you know, I've had people claim about their spouse, well, they like my hair a certain length. Well, it's not about, I mean, I, again, I would answer with what Peter and the other apostles answered in the book of Acts when they said we ought to obey God rather than men. And I believe that to be true. It ought to become what does God want of us first and foremost. Do what's pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ, and then if we can alter some things around to do what's pleasing to men so that way we can reach them with the gospel, then we can do that. But what God wants comes first and foremost. We do what he has told us to do. And folks, this is not difficult. This is not a hard issue. Men, just cut your hair. Women, don't. Or at least, you know, if you already have long hair, I know you got to trim it. That's totally understandable. Don't worry about that, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. But anyway, Again, John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want him as the authority over your head? Then do the things he's commanded us to do. He doesn't, his burden is light, folks. He doesn't tell us to do a whole lot of things we have to do. I mean, you need to get baptized. You ought not to eat blood, okay? You need to cook your meat, stay away from the fat, and have your hair the right length. I mean, how hard is this really to do? In 1 Corinthians 11, at the very end, 
Okay, 1 Corinthians 11. It's in verse 31, it says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We should judge ourselves, examine ourselves first and foremost. We should be the first targets of judgment. But you see, most people won't do that. It says, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. So when God judges us and he chastens us, he doesn't want us to be with the world. But if he doesn't chasten these people for these things, I mean, that's a scary thought. So I want people to be right with the word. That's what this is about. It's not about whether you're going to heaven or hell. It's about who is the authority over your life. So that's where we'll end that on that today, and then we have more topics along these lines we're going to keep picking up on in the next couple of weeks. So anybody have any questions or comments about anything we just talked about before we close today? All right, thanks everybody for joining us this week. May our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all as you study his word, and we will see you next week.